Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to Taking Stock Live. I'm coming to you all the way from Belize this week, and I want to send a special thanks to the Radisson Fort George Hotel for hosting me today in my lovely room. So if you've been following my IG stories, you'd see I've been having a blast walking down memory lane back home. For those of you who don't know, I'm actually from Belize originally. I've lived in Jamaica for about 13 years, but every now and again, you got to come home. You got to connect with your roots. Say hi to you family, eat up all that good food, and trust and believe I have been doing all of the above and quite a bit of it. I'll be back in my new home, Jamaica, my adopted home soon. But for now, we are bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. Drop a comment in the live chat. Let me know where you're watching us from, where you're joining us from in the world. I know we have viewers all over Jamaica and all over the world, and I'd be happy very pleased to know which part of the earth you are this lovely Tuesday evening. Well, we have a very excited show for you this evening as usual. So here's a look at what's coming up, followed by what's hot in business. The IMF wants Jamaica to raise interest rates even further and resist calls for a public sector wage increase. We'll find out why from IMF Mission Chief for Jamaica, Bass Backer. We'll also ask about their projections for Jamaica's growth. And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. Carib Cement shareholders are not happy about the company's plans to start paying royalties to parent company Cemex to use its trademarks and other intellectual property. And CVS, one of the largest pharmacy chains in the U.S., is planning to close 900 shops over the next three years to focus on health services. We'll discuss. But first, here's what's hot. Brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, is projecting Jamaica's economy will rebound from the fallout caused by the COVID-19 pandemic to record growth of over 8% this fiscal year. It's also projecting growth of up to 3.5% in the next fiscal year starting April 2022. In a statement last week, the IMF noted that the availability of pre-COVID-19 buffers, coupled with an ambitious reform program and strengthened oversight of the financial system, ensured the pandemic-related shock was not followed by a monetary crisis. However, it said the pandemic, inflation and natural disasters pose risks to the projections. Meanwhile, IMF said further tightening of monetary policy may be needed if the Bank of Jamaica BOJ is to bring inflation down. Communities and workers of Jamaica Cooperative CNWJ Credit Union will be buying back 10% of its 450 million deferred shares in issue. The decision comes as the shares are trading 20% below issue value. CNWJ had listed the deferred shares back in 2020. They initially offered investors a fixed return of 7.35% for 24 months on 5-year and 10-year instruments, but that's now adjusted periodically. The shares were sold at $2 each, allowing credit union members who participated in the credit union's private offer in June 2018 to trade their shares with non-members via the market. The shares opened at $1.60 on Monday. First Rock Capital Holdings is expanding in St. Lucia. First Rock Group President and Co-Founder Ryan Reed told the Jamaica Observer that it makes sense for the company to cement its presence in the country where the company is registered. However, he noted that the move would be dependent on them first notifying the Jamaica Stock Exchange where its shares are traded. The company has reportedly already pinpointed a number of commercial spaces within the industrial belt in the capital of Castres. First Rock recorded net profits of 1.8 million US dollars for the nine months ended September 30, 2021. Microfinancing company Dollar Financial Services raised another $200 million early this month in a private debt raise with an institutional investor. They've now raised $425 million since the start of the year. In June, they had raised $225 million in a private placement brokered by GK Capital. Dollar Financial Group CEO Kadeen Mears says the company continues to raise funding to further unlend to micro, small and medium enterprises in order to help the economy recover and adjust to living with COVID-19. 
Jamaica Producers Group JP is reporting a 24% increase in revenues for their third quarter ending October 2, 2021. Year to date, revenues have also gone up by 21%. JP Group CEO Jeffrey Hall says the revenue growth experienced across the group demonstrates the quality of the product and service lines and the resilience of their diverse portfolio of interests. Meanwhile, Hall says JP is also pursuing an acquisition strategy with new partners that will give the group a series of bold new platforms for growth in the Caribbean and Europe. What's Heart was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Hey, Moneymakers, you're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit KhalilaReynolds.com slash store to order your t-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. And Appleton Estate, Jamaican excellence. Welcome back, everybody, to Taking Stock. Let First, let me shout out everyone who's joining us from all around the world. Let me see who we have here. Raquel says, hey, moneymakers. Sean says, Kalila, Kalila, Kalila. Hey, Sean, Sean, Sean. <laughs> Raquel says she's live and living. Lavar says, Mandeville checking in. Sean again from Toronto. Ruthann from Kingston. Roger joining us from Ligany in Kingston. Andrew all the way in Harlem, New York. Chris Hill in Panama. Raquel from Kingston, Jamaica. Detours Jamaica is in Ochi. Orlando Harris is in the USA. Wow, I love it. I always love shouting out the diversity on the show. And of course, I'm joining you live and direct from the Radisson Port George Hotel in Belize City, Belize, uh, my home country, not my hometown. I have to stay in a hotel because I don't really have, well, I have family here in Belize City, but um, uh, I need certain amenities to make sure the show runs smoothly. Yeah? So they are hosting me and I'm really grateful for that. Well, like you saw in the introduction, we have quite a bit to talk about this week. And of course, if you want to chip in with your own questions, you can always use the live chat to do so to address our guest and to our analyst team coming up later on in the show. At this point, let me tell you, the IMF, I read that a staff concluding statement from their Article 4 mission 2021. It was issued to the Tuesday sometime last week, I believe it was issued, and it made for quite an interesting read. Among the recommendations were for Jamaica to raise interest rates even further, and you know that decision by the Bank of Jamaica has been quite controversial. I'm not sure if they factored in the additional raise that was announced probably the day before they released that statement. But we can ask our guest. They have another uh, set of recommendations as well. So let me introduce the guest with no further ado. Let's welcome the IMF, IMF Mission Chief for Jamaica, Bass Backer. Hello, good evening. Thank you. Hi, Bass. Very nice to meet you. You as well. I didn't even realize that we had a new Mission Chief to Jamaica. The last one I knew was, uh, was Yousef. So welcome to Jamaica. Thank you. I'm glad to have you. How long have you been in town? Um, well, we did a mission remotely because of COVID. Normally, we would have ah. traveled, but instead, we did it online, which ah, is which okay. is kind of sad. It was yeah. very interesting, but it would have been even more interesting to see everything. I'm sure uh, Jamaica would have been a nice assignment, huh? A nice station. Yes, very. I know you're from the Netherlands. Is that where you are, or you're in Washington? I'm in near Washington now at home. Ah, okay. Yeah. It's much, much nicer weather in Jamaica than in Washington right now, I can assure you. Yes. So yes. how long have you uh, took, taken over the portfolio for Jamaica? I started in May. In May. Okay. So just a few months and you yes. get to, to acquaint yourself with the country profile, uh, knowing we've come, come out of a, a two IMF agreements in what, about two years ago now, since we yes. ended those agreements and things... And then COVID hit. So, so from one thing to the next. So like I was saying, I read the, the article for a staff agreement recently. So let's start with the hot topic, which has been inflation. What's the IMF's position on inflation for Jamaica? Well, in the last few months, we have seen quite an increase in inflation in the world. As the world is recovering from the COVID crisis, there has been a sharp increase in global demand, but global supply has been constrained. 
And the result has been supply chain shortages, rising shipping costs, rising energy and rising food prices. In short, higher inflation. And Jamaica has been no exception. In May, inflation year on year was 4.4%. In October, it had increased to 85 and the Bank of Jamaica has an inflation target of 4 to 6%. So inflation is now well above the target. But this surge in inflation is not the result of the policy of the Bank of Jamaica. It's due to global factors. And inflation in Jamaica will come down once these global inflationary pressures abate, which hopefully will happen next year. In the meantime, it's important to prevent that high current inflation is not going to feed expectations of higher future inflation. If global inflation comes down, Jamaica inflation should come down too. And the recent tightening of monetary policy and clear future communication by the Bank of Jamaica will help with this. Mm. And so going forward, if inflation is higher than expected, and uh, we have all been surprised with global inflation, or if there is evidence that inflation developments are feeding inflation expectations, a further policy rate increases may be needed. Mm -hmm. So I do note that you, you mentioned that inflation in Jamaica is being driven by global inflation and all those supply chain issues that we have been talking about for the past couple of months. So why then, if that is the case, is the IMF recommending in this, uh, this Article 4 consultation that the BOJ uh, tighten its monetary policy even further by raising interest rates if the issue is not caused by a local demand issue? Well, what, what matters for the economy is real, real policy rates, so interest rates minus inflation. And with inflation having increased sharply, real policy rates have in fact gone down in recent months. So monetary policy is still very stimulating. Of course, the economy needs to recover, uh, but you also need to ensure that global inflation is not going to feed into domestic inflation. And for that, uh, monetary policy tightening has helped. And even after the tightening, uh, interest rates are still very low. So explain that relationship. How will tightening, how will raising interest rates help to improve inflation or reduce inflation? Well, if, if policy rates are too low, um, people start to worry about future inflation. You get, uh, you get pressure on the exchange rate. Um, the, the Bank of Jamaica has an inflation target, uh, and that inflation target has helped stabilize inflation in Jamaica. But people need to believe that the central bank is serious about the target. And if inflation keeps rising, and the central bank does not react, then people start to uh, start to worry that the central bank may not be uh, as serious about inflation. So if you tighten in a timely manner, you communicate clearly uh, what you're going to do forward, uh, then you ensure that people are not worried about future inflation and that they think this global uh, increase in inflation is temporary, and next time, next year, uh, when global inflation abates, inflation in Jamaica will come down as well. And then at that time, we can reduce the interest rates to where it was before? If inflation goes down in the future, uh, yes, there should be scope to reduce inflation, so your policy rate. But it also, of, of course, depends. Uh, hopefully, next year, uh, Jamaica will still be growing very strongly. And maybe next year, uh, domestic conditions uh, are so good that it will not be needed to reduce interest rates. All right. Before we continue, let me just ask you to tilt your, your laptop down a little bit. So, right. So let's see your face. That looks a lot better. All right. Thank you, Bass. So, yes. Yeah, so we've been talking about this inflation issue, the global inflation that's driving things, the expectation or the hope that this will all abate by next year. My gosh, when COVID hits, we, we, we had expected it would have been over by now too, but it, it isn't yet. It's still going. So several other issues also came up in the, the staff concluding statement. So you had the BOJ raising those policies 
policy rates. And you also had uh, the issue of wage negotiations that are ongoing here in, in Jamaica. And the IMF is recommending that the government actually resist uh, those demands to increase wages for public sector workers. Why at this time? Because it's it's such a difficult time for workers, for everybody. And I'm sure that everybody has been counting on that, uh, that increase. No, uh, we have not made any recommendation that the government resist demand to increase public sector wages. Perhaps that's my interpretation of the statement. We, we, you uh, can clarify have, that now. What, what we have said, uh, that the wage bill in Jamaica is quite high. And the government is talking about a new public sector compensation system. And we have said in our concluding statement that this would make the wage structure more transparent, more standardized, more equitable. It would also reduce the large differences in pay with the private sector. But we have said it would also add to the wage bill, which is already quite high compared with the rest of the region. And then the issue is government resources are limited and there are many competing needs for these resources. You have healthcare, education, public safety, infrastructure, and you can spend any dollar only once. And what we have therefore said in a concluding statement that a reassessment of the various roles and responsibility of the government and increasing efficiency in the provision of public services uh, that would help with a reduction in the size of the public workforce and that could help mitigate the rise in the wage bill which would result from uh, a new wage structure and a rise in the wage bill would of course leave less room for other spending so our worry was not about public sector wages it was about the public sector wage bill so isn't that the same thing a different way of saying the same thing no uh, in uh, if you over somewhat longer term, uh, the size of your wage bill depends on the number of public workers and how well you pay them. Uh, if you have a very well paid uh, public sector which is very efficient, then you clearly need fewer workers than if you have a less efficient workforce. So mm. there is a, there is some trade off uh, in efficiency and size of the public sector. So of the course, position is that the government should reduce the size of the public sector. Well, to Which the extent be... that to the extent that wages, uh, a new wage structure is going to increase wages, it would be helpful over the next few years to at least partially offset that. Uh, by increases in efficiency and reduce of the size. Otherwise, what would happen, the wage bill would raise further. The wage bill is already quite high. If you raise the wage bill further, you have less money for education, for healthcare, for investment. There are many, there are many other things where spending is quite needed. So the government has been doing some of that following the recommendations of the IMF, even through throughout the program that ended a couple of years ago. And they've been doing it through natural attrition. So when people retire or leave the public sector, they just don't fill those jobs. And they've been taking sort of soft measures to do it. Is it that they haven't been doing enough and perhaps layoffs are actually needed? Well, this is this is this is a decision. This is a political decision, and uh, for the for the government, but we see that the wage bill the wage bill is still is still quite high. How much too high is it? Like how well, much should they cut? That 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 is that is a that is a political decision, but you have many. Our but point we can is, make a recommendation. Uh, no, I leave that to politicians. But we say we need more. We need more investment, uh, more money for education might be helpful. Uh, there, are there, there, are lots of, there are lots of useful things. And if you spend it all on the extra wage bill, you don't have money for the other things left. 
Yes, so so we understand that, but it has been a sore point in the past. You know, there will always be a resistance to shedding public sector jobs, and especially when it comes to wages as well, because so many people uh, rely upon those jobs. So it's always going to be a controversial topic. But uh, but you you've spoken. <laughs> I wish you would say more, but I understand. Okay, it's a political decision to to, to go any further than that. So let's move on to another issue. Then uh, there's a quote that stuck out to me from the uh, report, and it's on uh, supervision of financial conglomerates. And the IMF is saying that that needs to be strengthened. So financial conglomerates, referring to, uh, well, let me just read the quote. It says. The supervision of financial conglomerates needs to be strengthened. The financial sector is dominated by complex financial conglomerates that operate in multiple jurisdictions. Some large groups' headquarters are based in jurisdictions that have different oversight practices. So to whom are you referring here and uh, how detrimental are these oversight practices to our economy? Well, let me put this a bit in context. Uh, oversight of the financial sector is very important. This is because financial crisis can be very costly, both in terms of the economic damage they can do and in terms of the fiscal costs. During the global economic and financial crisis, many countries, advanced countries suffered banking crisis and these countries went through a deep recession. And Jamaica had a financial sector crisis in the 1990s. Fortunately, financial sector supervision in Jamaica has greatly improved since then. And this has resulted in the development of a financial sector that is stable, liquid and profitable. Now, Jamaica has conglomerate groups with financial sector activities that include banking, insurance, pensions fund management, collective investment fund management and securities dealers. So it's important to make sure that they are well supervised uh, to ensure that problems in one part of a conglomerate do not affect other parts. And these groups often operate in multiple jurisdictions, especially in the Caribbean. And it's important to ensure that supervision is well coordinated with other supervisors. And the Bank of Jamaica, which supervises the deposit taking institutions, and the Financial Services Commission, which supervises the non deposit taking institutions, are keenly aware of all of this. They have been shifting their supervisory focus to holding companies to make sure they capture all risks. And the IMF has been helping by providing technical assistance. So uh, what we are, what we, in short, what we are saying, we are giving recommendations for further improvement and to warn for uh, uh, possible future risk and further refining everything. It's not, uh, it's not that we see great, great looming dangers. We have said that the oversight of the financial sector is good and we have a stable uh, and well-capitalized sector. So how might they accomplish that? Um, uh, well, they're currently working on the implementation of a consolidated supervision uh, framework for cross-border, uh, that includes cross-border supervision. Uh, uh, the Financial Services Commission is drafting an amendment uh, to facilitate a regime for consolidated supervision of non-deposit taking insurance group. So they're doing they're doing a lot of things. Uh, they're working on it. Uh, it's important that this work get, that this work is finalized in the future. Mm. You know, uh, an issue that we have talked about repeatedly over the past several years, probably been several decades in Jamaica, is the issue of growth, which just seems to continue eluding this country. The, the IMF projection for Jamaica is to hit 8.5, I believe, percent growth next year. But that is coming from, you know, coming post-COVID. So, so most countries are expected to grow coming out of a pandemic and coming out of a global recession. So that's not unusual uh, for Jamaica. It, it sounds like a pretty number, but it, not, it isn't necessarily because it's coming from a low point. But the IMF has made the point in this consultation that low growth is 
is not the result of low investment or low uh, growth employment, but of declining productivity. So there's been lots of investment in Jamaica, jobs have been created, but we still haven't seen the economic growth that would be expected based on those levels of investment and the jobs that have been created. Why is that? Um, maybe we can put a step back. Uh, gr growth in Jamaica has been low for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, why has growth been low? Well, one reason is Jamaica has had repeated crises from which it often took a long time to recover. For example, Jamaica was hit hard by the global economic and financial crisis of 2008 and 9. At that time, in three years, GDP fell by 6%. And then it took almost a decade before GDP was back at the pre-crisis level. But growth has also been low during expansions. The last time in the pre-COVID years that growth exceeded 2% was 15 years ago in 2006. So one contributing factor has been the decline of Jamaica's traditional export industries. Mm. Sugar and bananas were hurt by the phasing out of preferential trade access to the EU and the US. Aluminum and bauxite lost market share to more efficient competitors. Uh, this was to some extent offset by a rapid growth of tourism. But overall, export growth in the past 25 years has been very low, about 0.1% per year. And growth has also been held back by structural factors. One is human capital. If you compare test scores of students and average years of schooling in Jamaica with it in other countries, Jamaica scores relatively low. On top of that, there has been a significant brain drain. Many university graduates have immigrated. And high crime is another problem. High energy costs have likely also played a role. Um, and then going, turning to uh, productivity, uh, what we see in uh, what matters for living standards is increases in productivity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and over time, living standards and productivity, they go hand in hand. I've been hearing this this productivity argument for, for many years. People always comment on low productivity. How do we measure productivity of workers? How do you uh, know that productivity has declined? So GDP, value added, say production in the economy, and you divide it by the number of workers. So if employment grows faster than GDP which is what's been happening in Jamaica, then productivity declines. And so what we have seen in Jamaica in the past three decades, productivity levels have declined, have been declining. Normally that would lead to also to a decline of GDP per capita. Fortunately in Jamaica, it has been offset uh, by more people working. So the share of the working age population in the population has been has increased. In, in the past, you had a very young population and now not, not as much. And so that more people working per person, that has helped. So we're hiring more people, but they're not doing as much. Yeah, this is, of course, uh, it's somewhat of a puzzling, uh, puzzling issue that uh, productivity keeps going down. Uh, it may in part be... Uh, a composition issue, but we have seen that uh, hotels and construction have seen rapid growth, but productivity in these sectors is low. M productivity is higher in manufacturing, but it is a sector where growth has been low. So if low productivity sectors grow faster than higher productivity, then average productivity may go down. So that may be a uh, part uh, of, this, of the solution behind this puzzle. But Productivity declining for several de for decades is um, is a, is a bit uncommon. Uncommon among all the countries in the world that uh, that IMF uh, monitors. Uh, yes, in most in most countries you see productivity in increasing over time. In in some countries it grows very rapidly, uh, like we have seen many countries in East Asia where productivity uh, grows has been very rapid. Say China. Uh, Eastern Europe also. Uh, other countries, it's not grown as rapidly. 
but seeing a country where it's been declining and GDP per capita in Jamaica is not any higher than it was in 1970. Uh, that's, that's 50 years ago. Wow. And it really is puzzling. It's It's been something that politicians have struggled with, economists have struggled with, the IMF team has struggled to explain as well over the years. But I'm going to take this last question, Vass, and this is from one of our viewers. Why did I suddenly turn purple? <laughs> What's going on with my lighting? All right. So last question comes from Detours Jamaica, who says, does the fact that Jamaica's debt, which far exceeds Jamaica's GDP, have an effect on inflation and interest rates? And how on earth can you project such a high recovery? Let, let, let me start uh, with the last question. In, in the previous fiscal year, the economy declined by 11%. So if we have a rebound this year of 8%, then you're not yet back at pre-crisis levels. Of course, uh, so that puts the high growth uh, a bit in context. Uh, what we have seen uh, this year in the second quarter, so the March June quarter, uh, GDP was 14% higher than the same period the year earlier. And we have seen flight arrival data for the third quarter, and that uh, confirms that uh, tourism is recovering nicely. So, uh, a gross projection of slightly over 8% for this fiscal year uh, does not seem uh, too optimistic. Then the question about uh, the impact of Jamaica's debt uh, on interest rates and inflation. Um, well, if you have, if your debt ke keeps increasing, as what happened in Jamaica in the uh, late 90s and 2000s, uh, interest rates go up and interest payments go up. Uh, and that, that uh, further increases uh, your deficit and further increases your debt. And then you get a very vicious cycle. In 2019, so in 2009, Jamaica was spending 17% of GDP annually in interest payments. Mm -hmm. That's money that not can not be spent on uh, wages. It cannot be spent on healthcare. It's just interest. So what has happened in the past decade, uh, Jamaica has reined in its debt, uh, interest payments have come down and interest rates have come down. And so now currently interest payments are only 6% of GDP, so much lower. That's a big improvement. That's a big improvement. And the government wants to reduce the debt further to 60% of GDP in 2027, 28, and that would result in further interest savings of another 3%. So it's very important to uh, further reduce the debt. Um, so the, currently the government uh, is planning that. It's in the fiscal responsibility law as well. This has really helped in the past uh, decade. It's gonna help further in the, in the next decade. Uh, so as long as debt keeps going down and the government is running fiscal surpluses. So there is also not much to borrow. It's not going to have uh, much impact on interest rates. How much very... has COVID set us back though? Because we were supposed to be, I think probably at about 90% debt to GDP now, and it is still over a hundred because of the impact of the pandemic. Yeah, and it set uh, the, the target for reaching the 60% of GDP uh, has been shifted back by two years. Mm. Of course, it is uh, the economic damage it has done is quite is uh, quite tremendous. So it has also made it more difficult. But yeah, about about two years. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Bass, all the way there in Washington D.C. We appreciate your presence, your patience with us, and your explanations. Thanks again. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I want to say a special thank you as well from our sponsor, Appleton. Ordinarily, I would have a bottle here for you, but because I'm not in Jamaica, I didn't, have, I didn't uh, bring it with me. But uh, take a sip of Appleton if you ever get a chance, okay? Really? Thank <laughs> you very time, much. Next time you come to Jamaica, take a sip of Appleton rum. <laughs> thank you. All right, good. Good night. So, so that is the segment for now. We are going to have a discussion with the analysts very shortly on a number of topical issues as well. But first, here's your market recap. Moment of taking stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. 
insurance made easy. And Appleton Estate, Jamaican excellence. Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange declined, with the combined index nearly losing a whopping 9,000 points, or 2%. 106 stocks traded across both the main and the junior markets of the JC for the week ending Friday, November 19, 2021. 32 advanced, 66 declined, and 8 stayed the same. 102 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling nearly $1.4 billion. Wigton Wind Farm Ordinary Shares saw the most trading activity. It took up nearly 11% of market volume. People bought and sold close to 11 million shares in the company. The stock's price remained the same to open this new week at 50 cents. Carreras traded at the second highest volume, with people buying 9 million shares in the company. The stock lost 15 cents to open this new week at $8.06. And JMMB Group rounded out the most traded, taking up 8% of market volume. The stock gained 58 cents to open this week at $38.01. Now, let's see who had the biggest gains for the week. Margaritaville Turk's stock price jumped nearly 50% to close last week at $22.78. AMG Packaging and Paper Company stock price rose nearly 33% to close last week at $2.26. And rounding out our biggest gains, KLE Group is up nearly 24% to open this week at $3. On the losing side now, Caribbean Cement Company was the biggest loser for the week, down 25%. The stock closed last week at $74.92, following news that the company plans to start paying royalties to its parent company, CMEX, in Mexico, despite not paying dividends to minority shareholders for several years. Paramount Trading Jamaica stock fell nearly 19% to open this new week at $1.05. And rounding of the week's biggest losers, Cygnus Credit Investment. JMD Ordinary Shares. The stock fell nearly 16% to close last week at $15.60. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, the Analysts, is brought to you by Proven Wealth and Ideal Portfolio Services. Welcome back to Taking Stock. So it's time to introduce our analyst panel for this evening. Who do we have today? Wealth Advisor at Ideal Portfolio Services, Dwayne Taylor. Assistant Manager of Private Equity at Proven Management, Julian Morrison. And Research and Strategy Analyst at Sagicor Investments, Jodian Aris. Give them a, I feel like we need a, an applause. Hey, welcome everybody. Great to see you. Hey. Good evening, Nikalila. Yes, Nikalila. Yes, yes. All right. So, as you would have noted in the market recap just now, Carib Cement is uh, one of the biggest losers for the week. And that is because shareholders aren't quite happy. Well, I should just let you guys explain it. So, what's going on with Carib Cement, Dwayne? <laughs> All right, Kalila. Good night, everyone. All right. So recently, it was announced that uh, Carib Cement, uh, well, they're meeting to discuss if they should should pay uh, pretty much trademark fees to their parent company, Cimex. Now that has caused a bit of issue in the market because obviously Carib Cement operates under this company. So why no would you introduce this trademark fee? And normally for these things, it's, it's really translated over to the consumer. Because if there's an additional cost for carb cement, you can only imagine that us as consumers would feel that for persons who would need to utilize their product. So it's, it's causing a bit of a stir in the market. And if you know anything about trademarking, normally there's a 25% rule. So any profits that carb cement were to make, it's, there's, a put, it, there's a likelihood that 25% of that would be going to their parent company. So, I mean, it's yet to be confirmed. Obviously, they're going to meet and discuss it further, but it, it, it's causing a bit of concern as to why you charge that no or but, place that on us no. So, Julian, don't they already pay royalties to their other parent company in Trinidad? Yes, um, they do, based on the, the standing agreement. But the fact is, um, this is something that... We're all watching very closely, but, and this is just my own opinion now. I have to be very clear about that. Um, 
I think that while it is a shock, it doesn't necessarily change the thesis around the company itself because of the other fundamentals associated with um, building real estate in Jamaica, that is, and the fact that we're going through a construction boom. So what we've noticed is that building is taking place in several parishes, not just in the Kingston and St. Andrew metropolitan area. So that means that the demand for cement should be sustained going forward, and it may just offset some of the pressures that we're seeing that could come from this new agreement. So in my personal opinion, it does change things in terms of um, how much more value shareholders could see. But the fact is, the original thesis might not necessarily be different based on what I just mentioned. But Jodian, aren't shareholders, is, a part of it is that shareholders are already uh, not particularly pleased with carb cement because they haven't paid a dividend in so long, yet they want to pay all these royalties to the parent company. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I think initially you'd probably want to think that if it is that the company were to probably pay from the bottom line and then just the dividend for everybody, then that would be, you know, somewhat level the playing field. So it is somewhat for investors, somewhat of a, a little bit of a hit in the face to think that, you know, you're taking and you're not giving me a little reward as well. Um, but I'd, I'd agree with Julian on the, the, you know, the company itself fundamentally still remains, um, you know, have a positive outlook on the basis of real estate. I think the main concern though would be in relation to if it is that, you know, as a company, the focus is now going to be seen that the royalty structure that they are implementing is on revenue. Um, you know, you may want to have a little consideration. Is it that there's going to be a shift in focus for the company, um, seeing that the parent company will be getting their their bulk um from that top line and not so much focus as much on <coughs> bottom line which is where shareholders really get the reward but they did indicate that there is a dividend policy that they are working on and so that should you know bring a little bit of you know possibility for compensation i guess to to investors so i have a little scoop for you guys right so <laughs> i come to believe it's supposed to be kind of a vacation but you know my mind never really stops working and i find out some information because it turns out there is a Guatemalan company named Progreso, and they are a cement manufacturer, and they have recently set up operations in Belize. Anybody want to take a guess why they have set up operations here? Mm. <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> Access to the CARICOM market. <laughs> well. So, yeah, they, from what I understand, have intentions to start exporting to Jamaica and the wider Caribbean, but specifically Jamaica, uh, possibly by next year. So uh, some further competition may be coming for Carib Cement soon. And Progresso is a fairly large company. I haven't done much research on them yet but i've been hearing things and they do have operations here already so so yeah so that's a little scoop based on me being here some information mm -hmm. that i found out all right and thank you for everyone who oh, that's a that's a scoop for all our taking stock mm -hmm. day ones all the loyalists <laughs> yeah yeah it's good to be on the ground because i mean i wouldn't i guess but i remember reading about um, new substitutes coming into the market in terms of um, persons looking to import uh, so, um, cement. So it therefore creates a different picture around what the market will look like going forward. Uh, clearly, market share won't necessarily change overnight, but the interesting thing with building and real estate and construction is that price is very important. So mm -hmm. if these substitutes are significantly cheaper and they can get the job done, then that could be material, mm -hmm. pun intended. So Let's see. yeah, we need to watch that in terms of pricing. Absolutely, something to keep our eyes on. All right, so let's look at another local topic before we go overseas. Uh, Jody and the, the Bank of Jamaica, they, they always track the remittance inflows because it is a very important number for Jamaica. That's the money that people abroad send back home and it contributes quite significantly to the country's GDP. So for the first 10 months of 2021, that's up to the end of October, uh, the remittances came up to about 2.5 billion US dollars, and that's up from 2 billion last year. 
for the same period. So that's quite a significant increase. What's going on there? Uh, yes, it is. Um, what we're seeing is, is really a continuation of what has been happening from last year. Um, so if it is that you, you note that when it is that we look at the trend for last year, I'm not sure if you see my screen, but when it is that you look at the trend um, for September um, 2020, so this is the latest bulletin that we have out, even though information is already out for 20, for October, um, you notice that the trend in 2020, there would have been this big jump up um, of 40%. And so we have been seeing, you know, constantly rising um, in terms of remittances since the impact of COVID. And so, you know, it is something that has been happening and we're seeing it for 2021 as well. And we want to know that total remittance um, inflows for 2021 for 2020 was 2.9 billion and we're already at 2.5. And so if it is that you use like an average of, you know, inflows for the past 10 months, um, you know, you're almost at best going to be hitting that total um, for 2021. So when it is that we look at 2021 relative to 2020, we're anticipating, even if we have a little bit of a slowdown, um, for the last two months that we probably still exceed uh, what it is that happened in 2020. And, you know, that, that's really some amount of positive news coming out of the central bank. Um, remittances do provide quite a bit of a cushion um, for the economy during the tough times. And so when you look at the macro indicators, um, we do know that there has been an improvement for remittances. So remittances as a share of GDP in 2020 was 21%, coming from 15% in 2019. And, you know, part of that is because, you know, GDP would have been low and remittance it increased. So you'd have seen that steep jump. But mm -hmm. as it is that we go forward into 2021, um, even though GDP is going to increase, we're still anticipating that we'd probably see not go back to the levels that we were in 2019 quite as yet. So we could still be, you know, remittances as a share of GDP around 18% in 2021, um, you know, which is positive for the economy because it means that, you know, particularly for retail companies, it's, helping persons who are here domestic um, to be able to purchase and to buy. And so that is, it's actually, you know, quite favorable for us. So we, we are really happy for this sort of good news that we're seeing. Yeah, so diaspora stepping in on our behalf, friends and family helping out. All right, so let's look at some global news now. Dwayne, CVS is one of the largest pharmacy chains in the United States. But now they're actually planning to close 900 shops over the next three years. Why are they closing so many pharmacies? What's going on with CVS? And how has the market responded to that news? All right. So the market has actually responded well <laughs> to, to much of what CVS has been doing of late. I'm just going to show you something from my screen, uh, their performance year to date. All right. So as you can see, the market has responded really well to CVS year to date. They have been up 33.79%. Uh, and uh, this news is really coming off of the heels of their financials, their Q3 financial performance. Now, it has been a stellar Q3 for the company. Um, just to highlight some of their the key figures. So total revenue has actually been up 10% year over year. Uh, closing at roughly 73.8 billion and also their eps both gap and adjusted are up 29 and 18.7 percent respectively now as you can see from the from the diagram their performance really has been stellar and even their cash on hand we can safely say that cvs is a major cash cow based off of just the inflow of uh cash from their operations over 194 percent no, they've so also... if they're doing so well, why are they closing stores? So I'm going to get to all of that for okay. you. I want to paint okay. the picture and set the table first. <laughs> all right. So to move to just, um, well, you can project again. All right. Let me just you can share my screen again. Right. So now in terms of their financial position, they've also improved that um, in 20 since uh, since this year. So we found that they've been able to repay a long-term debt in, since Q3, roughly $1.1 billion. And they've also, from year to date, they've, 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 been paying, they've been paying consistently towards their debt. So essentially, they've paid down $6.5 billion. And uh, since their acquisition of a healthcare insurance business that they have um, since 2018, it's called AFNA, 
they've repaid total 18.7 billion in their long-term debt. Now, this is all whilst balancing paying dividends. And they've, they've actually paid 659 million in dividends for Q3. Now, I'm mentioning all of this positive stuff, but they're still closing 900 locations over the next mm -hmm. few years. The reality is they are taking a more strategic um, approach to this. Now, in terms of, yes, it's 900 locations. We're thinking about potential jobs being lost, but the fact is they have a lot of locations that logistically are overlapping with one another. And as such, they're not being uh, as profitable or they're not performing in an optimal manner. So essentially what they're, they're looking to do is remove some of these locations so that uh, some of the more active locations, some of the more, uh, well, the foot traffic that's coming into those locations, they can perform better. And what they've also uh, pitched, or not, not necessarily pitched, but what they've put to the market is that they're looking to capitalize on the digital sphere. They're looking to move a lot of their operations online into a virtual space. And mm -hmm. they've actually announced a primary healthcare uh, option to the public. So no, this is like a first, this is a first point of contact for individuals. So imagine now a reality where you don't necessarily have to go into uh, to see a doctor or something like that. You can have a first point of contact and from there, you can either be driven to the CVS location or uh, maybe to a local physician based off of the need. You know, mm -hmm. they're embracing the digital sphere. And this is just another strategic move by them. So having... Then, for, for those types of consultations, and I know during the pandemic, CVS has been one of the places where you can go get COVID tested as exactly. well. It's been a very popular location for COVID testing. But mm -hmm. doesn't that rely on foot traffic? So people actually physically walking in the door because they have to swab your nose. So <laughs> I still am not sure I get it. So even with closing 900 locations, there's still an optimal amount of locations to cater to the demand from the foot traffic or for individuals to get their healthcare products or getting a COVID uh, test or even getting the vaccine. And also a lot of the locations, they're in a, a bad state in the sense that they need to be renovated. Mm. So to avoid incurring that additional cost of doing a massive renovation for the CVS locations, it would make more sense to close those locations in the interim and allow for the, I guess you could say, the better situated and better looking locations to accommodate the foot traffic and any persons that would be interested in their healthcare products or service. And the thing about it is, it's not that this, this, this may necessarily be a permanent thing. They're testing this uh, just to see how, how best the market responds to it. If it is that the demand for locations increase, let's say there's a location in particular that's overwhelmed by the foot traffic, then they can, they can open up a new location or reopen a location that they closed down to accommodate that traffic. Mm. So from a shareholder's point of view, you know, we're, we're recognizing that this is them cutting their costs. This is going to be mm -hmm. better for us in the long term. Right. The person who, the, the, the investors that would more or less feel the pinch of this would be real estate investors. Because you're thinking mm. 900 different locations, right. you know, the leasing and um, the, the potential revenue right. that they would get from that, they would really feel the pinch of it. But from a shareholder standpoint, this is definitely a, an excellent strategic move by CVS to really cut their costs and really make the most of, you know, the operation and this new interest for a digital type of uh focus yeah. well i can see why shareholders and investors would be responding positively to that news because uh fewer locations and fewer staff uh, and more equals more profits right fewer I know, well in this case <laughs> in, this, in this case it's uh, uh, not necessarily how we typically traditionally think about company growth yeah but they, the attempt is to do more with less and it goes back to the same discussion that we were having with Bass Backer from the IMF earlier mm -hmm. about productivity, about how we have, we've been hiring and hiring and hiring in Jamaica, but the outcome hasn't been positive. So we've been producing less with more people rather than producing more with less. Right. <laughs> so right. let's see how CVS uh, tries to make it or how CVS makes it work. 
over the next uh, few months and couple of years. So mm -hmm. Julian, we're looking also at another global company, US global investment management firm, T. Rowe Price. Their nine months, 2021 earnings are out. What are the highlights? Okay, I will share my screen now. <laughs> Can you see it? Uh, not yet. There we go. I see it now. Yes, it's up. Okay. So normally I start with the company fundamentals. So here we can see that net revenues are up. They're up about 27%, um, 27.6% to 5.71 billion. And in terms of earnings, which is what we're interested in as shareholders primarily, um, the company is up 47.4% to 2.34 billion. What's interesting is that even in this inflationary regime, where we're seeing a bit of a spiral, meaning that you know inflation is running hot on a persistent basis, is overshooting the target range for many central banks, we're seeing that operating expenses went up 15% to 2.86 billion. So it means that they've been able to manage their margins. Yes, 15% is quite a bit, but from the standpoint of profitability, their margins remain healthy. So that's good for the business. Now, in terms of what drove revenues, we're seeing where equity mutual funds had the leading segment um, coming out in terms of growth. And what's interesting is that it's also their largest earning segment. So that specific segment, which is equity mutual funds, we can see that here, it actually earns more than two thirds of their total revenues. So that's very important. We can see it right here in this line. So it means that the area that is bringing in the lion's share of the revenues is seeing most of the growth. So that's very good. And why would this happen? It's because equity markets have been doing so well and equity investors tend to, especially those that invest in funds, to be specific, they tend to look at market performance and that tends to support inflows for mutual funds. So what does all of this really mean? So T. Rowe Price is actually a mutual fund management company, and they essentially earn fee income from managing those assets. So when persons buy those um, mutual fund products, they actually earn fees from managing these products. So essentially, when inflows increase, and also when the value of the funds increase, they earn from both, um, both of those two factors, which have been persisting pretty much, as we can see from the financial results. Now, what's important is that operating cash flows are also up, um, and they're up 61% to 3.09 billion, here we go. Net cash provided by operating activities. And what this means is that we're seeing that earnings quality is high, which is very important. So it's not just profit for profit's sake, but it's profit that is actually bought by cash flows. So that's very important. And in terms of the balance sheet, their debt to equity is about 1.5 times. So it means that the company is in a healthy financial position. Um, this company is not just growing their profits, but they're actually managing their balance sheet. They're growing their cash. In terms of cash on the balance sheet itself, it's at 3.42 billion. And we can talk a little bit about the stock now. Now that we know that the company is doing fairly well, given the, the situation at hand. So the price is $208.37 um, as at the time of this recording, which translates to a PE of about 15.88 times. So we can see that here, which is the trailing PE. Um, the return on equity is 36.98%, call it 37%. So if you're running a PE of, call it 16 times, and your return on equity is 37%, it means that this company is growing exceptionally well, using their resources, and it means that it commands a higher PE, meaning that the company is worth more because it's growing fast and the numbers are there to back it financially. So it means that a company like this um, could trade at a higher PE, say 18 times, 19 times, given the conditions. So that, translate to, that translates to about 
$222. And now it's at $208. Now, just to put it into perspective, the stock is down 7.2% from the 52-week mm. high, right? So the 52-week high is here, $224, wink, wink. Remember, I just mentioned <laughs> a price point a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually up 6.87% from the um, from the 200-day moving average. So it means that the stock has been creeping up over the last 200 days. So it's building some momentum, but it's still down from the 52-week high, as I mentioned. So it means that it has some space to run. And just from the standpoint of odds or the likelihood of it going up, it means that it's not far from the price point I just mentioned and the reasons why that price point would actually um, materialize. So again, there's a risk though. We realize that passive investing is becoming more, more prevalent on the US market and passive investing is when investors buy investment products that match the performance of an index. So that's passive investment, investments. Active investments are investments that are supposed to beat the performance of an index. So unit trusts, mutual funds, products like that, pretty much they're supposed to beat the performance of an index, whether that be the Jamaica Stock Exchange um, main market index, or in this case, the S&P 500 index. We are basically trusting the investment manager to build an equity fund that can outperform the main equity index in this case, which would be the S&P 500 index. Now, the argument is that active managers haven't been able to justify the fees that they earn because the S&P 500 index has been growing faster mm -hmm. and outperforming a lot of these managers. Last year, S&P 500 grew like 45%, which is huge. Right. And it's actually up 24.88% year to date. You and see? up 29% year over year. That's very difficult. So to for do. you to beat that as an investment yeah. manager is, is yeah. tough. Pretty much, yeah. You're going to have to draw for all the crystal balls. <laughs> so um, it's not impossible, though. And we need to put that into context. A big part of why the equity market has been on a tear, that's what we we'll call it, it's on a tear, it's an extremely rapid run, is because of liquidity. And, of course, there are, there are companies large companies that are well run that have still been able to grow their earnings so you have your large tech players some of the fang stocks and so on in netflix your apple and others who have been able to position themselves in such a way that they can grow talking about amazon they benefited big time from e-commerce the e-commerce boom in the pandemic so when these large stocks meaning that they're the largest stocks in the index they can influence the movement of the index so when you have a large tech stocks growing their earnings and persons buying the stock as a result that will drive up the index so it means that the performance of these mega cap technology stocks are going to drive the performance of the index especially because the fed injected funds as well um so those are two main factors that would have make made the market um surpass the expectations of many many of us couldn't see this coming but i still think there's space for active management in the market you don't have to choose purely between active management and passive um, management. You can buy an index fund that tracks the growth of the index and you can still buy a mutual fund because you can have two different strategies and it's all about investing within a certain context. So it doesn't have to be either or. And you provide that service there at Proven Wealth, right? Yes, we do. That's right. <laughs> All nice right. Plug, that... <laughs> <laughs> well, you do too, right, Dwayne and, and Jorian? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so viewers and listeners, if you're interested in an actively managed fund, you can contact any of our sponsors, Proven Wealth, Ideal Portfolio Services, Sagicor Investments, and get that service. If you're interested in any of the uh, stocks mentioned to date, so T. Rowe Price and CVS being the international ones, Proven and Ideal can hook you up. If you're interested in the local stock, Carib Cement or any others, any of these three, you can contact them and get your stock on. Ingrid says Netflix, Amazon, and Apple are good stocks to own. Well, those oh, are one last point, Kali. I uh -huh. forgot to mention. T Row Price actually pays dividends, and their dividend yield is about two percent. So that's a sweetener for for investors who are interested in 
increase in dividend income. That's a nice in- point. How, how you forget that? Oh <laughs> you my, like I, the I, dividend? I it. I have it, yeah. All right, cool. I guess I should drop uh, this in as well. Um, mm-hmm. See this as well. <laughs> Pays roughly two point, about 2% uh, dividend yield as well. So nice. both both yeah. stocks can work for, for, for persons interested in, in, in dividends. dividends yeah. Nice. And of course, our standard disclaimer, this is not intended as investment advice. Contact your licensed investment advisor at your firm so contact these guys uh, personally contact the firms and get your one-on-one consultation to meet your individual investment needs thank you so much guys all right thank you Carilo. all right we'll all be right. right back to wrap and take some of your final comments this segment of taking stock the analysts was brought to you by proven wealth and ideal portfolio services so just before we go, let me see what you guys have been saying. So Roger Roberts commenting on Carib's men say, yes, man, Carib needs some competition under him skin. At least we as the consumer can get something out of all of this. And then one, two says, what about business leasing of homes and cottages in Jamaica? Is that aspect of real estate getting better? Well, I think that would get better as tourism improves because you said homes and cottages. So that sounds like the Airbnb type of market. But leasing sounds a little bit more long term. So I don't know. But I, I do think that as tourism improves, those are going to improve. Let's see. Shams says CVS has a lot of locations in the U.S. I don't think it makes a difference. Plus, they have new competition. What's the new competition? So they have Walgreens has been there in New York. If you know New York, Dwayne Reed is like on every block. So, yeah, they do have lots of competition. Sometimes it's like a CVS on one block and then another block over there's another one. I don't know. Uh, Ingrid says, that's true. My son got his COVID test at CVS. We did it while sitting in our car in the drive through so, and as uh, Dwayne mentioned, they also do the vaccine. So, yeah, uh, let's see. Geek Khan says, more efficient to focus on logistics, referring to the same CVS conversation. Uh, he also says that brick and mortar is redundant. I don't think necessarily so, given that uh, they're doing the COVID testing and the vaccine issuing, and they want to focus on consultations. It's not necessarily redundant anymore, because those are things that require a face-to-face service. And then one who had responded to that saying, it's not meant to drive innovation and productivity for regular people. Western culture thrives off slavery and there's further need for slaves due to the revelation of expansion in space. Uh, by slavery, I think, yeah, I'm sure you mean uh, low wages. That's another issue. Sham says, when the local contractors do work, they overrun the budget. Thank God we have highways now. It makes our country better for investment. I think I want to take this last one. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, Geek again. How can these those drive real productivity, innovation, and economic development when the majority of those parent companies are foreign? It's a discussion we've been having for decades. Been looking at that with the tourism industry. Same issue. Uh, the flows just go right out at the profits just go right outside of jamaica the same thing happens with the cement industry right now well i want to thank you all for joining me yet another evening i appreciate your presence and i'm super happy that this broadcast went smoothly because i was a bit nervous i'm not connected to my i'm not in my usual location in my studio connected to my wi-fi which I know is reliable. So I I was praying that this held up, but thank you again to the Radisson Fort George Hotel in Belize City for accommodating me. And so just so you know, if you're ever here, it's a great place to stay. And clearly they have very reliable Wi-Fi because it didn't chip out, not once. So thanks again. We'll see you again, same time, same place next week. Check out all my other shows this week. A lot coming up as usual. And also since we are done, Now you can also go and take this week's poll question over on the uh, community tab on the YouTube channel. So the poll question was actually about, here it is, what do you think is Jamaica's biggest problem right now? What do you think is Jamaica's biggest problem right now? So the options were crime, corruption, uh, I can't remember the others, but you can see them over there on the community tab. Take the poll and let us know what you think. Thank you, everybody. 
See you again next week. And remember, the masterclass is dropping very, very soon. We're scheduled for next week, Tuesday. But since I've been away, I've just been, oh, I don't know. I'm going to try to make it next week, Tuesday as planned. But we'll see. I'll let you guys know. Thank you again. See you later. Bye-bye. And of course, let's get this money. Bye, everybody. Let's get this money. <laughs> <laughs>